Frieza is exiting his spaceship. His mission? Destroy planet Vegeta and all the Saiyans that inhabit it. The Super Saiyan, and even to a lesser extent, the Super Saiyan God, scared Frieza enough that he wanted rid of the Saiyan race. Beerus' blessing was just the icing on the cake, so Frieza looks down at the planet and sees a single Saiyan flying in the upper atmosphere. Seemingly, he knows what's about to happen, but with his power level, he can't stop what's about to happen. So Frieza launches the key ball at Planet Vegeta, maniacally laughing as he does, and waiting to watch the power levels drop to nothing. Bardock fires his own blast back at Frieza, a desperate but useless effort because even using his non-canon power level of 10,000, which we will use for the sake of this video, he just isn't enough. As his own blast is pushed back with ease, he thinks about the planet behind him. Gine, the woman who changed his life and his outlook. Raditz, stuck with that upstart, arrogant little prince. And Kakarot, sent away to some foreign planet where he may never see his parents again. Kakarot may not even survive, despite how weak the Earth actually is. If Bardock couldn't stop this attack, the family he's come to care about would dissolve right away in front of him. In that moment, despair became fear, and fear turned to rage. The kindness Gine had instilled in him gave him just enough purity to become what had only been a legend till this point. The Super Saiyan. In an explosive final push, Bardock's blast destroys Frieza's with ease. The power Bardock has as a Super Saiyan is less than Frieza's first form, but Frieza is off guard and holding back. He hadn't expected a Super Saiyan to awaken in the final moments of Planet Vegeta, so before Frieza can even release his full power, Bardock's blast continues after destroying the Death Ball and disintegrates Frieza before he knows what hit him. From here, Bardock uses his immense power to quickly dispose of the rest of Frieza's soldiers. One by one, they fall at his hands. The soldiers who had looked down on and even mocked the Saiyans were finally put down and overthrown by the legend that their emperor feared. On planet Vegeta, a true rebellion had started, but some of Frieza's men were able to destroy the ships and flight bays before they were killed, a final act of vengeance to show the Saiyans were not nothing without the Frieza Force. Bardock returns to planet Vegeta and helps finish off the rest of Frieza's men. Then he quickly finds Gine, asking her if she's okay and telling her that something crazy happened. She can tell by the hair, but she tells him not to worry about that now. They have to go get Kakarot now that Frieza is defeated. With no ships on the planet, they'd have to think of something else. Bardock asks some of the royal engineers how long creating new ships will take. They tell the Super Saiyan that without parts from the Frieza Force, it could take over a decade to get one moderately sized ship up and running. That's not including the launch bays and the landing pads. Bardock thinks it over and asks if having a mostly intact ship could speed up the process. The engineer says yes, but where would they get such a ship? The Frieza Force destroyed the ships extremely thoroughly. Bardock doesn't say a word and flies upwards at full speed. He comes back down with Frieza's ship in his arms. He asks the engineer if this will do, and he simply nods. As opposed to making new ships, repairing Frieza's ship, the launching and landing bays only takes around five years. Not ideal, but better than waiting over a decade. Once the ship is finished, Bardock is told and he gets ready to bring Gine with him to go get Kakarot from Earth. As he makes his way to the launch bay, he's met by a group of high-ranking Saiyans and King Vegeta himself. King Vegeta tells Bardock that this ship will be used for colonization and resource gathering. It has room for many Saiyans and will be used for the betterment of their species rather than a rescue mission for his son. Bardock gets angry. Not only was Frieza's ship something he got for them, they'd all be dead without him. King Vegeta tells him that whether Super Saiyan or not, he's still not the king of the Saiyans. Bardock couldn't believe what he was hearing. The Saiyans living a life of destruction and conquest is what led them to almost be destroyed by Frieza. Did King Vegeta really think returning to that life wouldn't lead to the same thing? Bardock couldn't let this stand any longer. Over the last five years, he's managed to further his understanding of the Super Saiyan form, 
enough to harness its power at will. He walks towards King Vegeta, and as he does, he activates Super Saiyan. Bardock makes it very clear in that moment that no one will keep him away from his son. King Vegeta sees that he's outmatched, but if he doesn't at the very least challenge Bardock, he'll never be respected by his subordinates ever again. So he charges in. Bardock stands completely still, taking punch after punch without so much as twitching. A single punch in retaliation was enough to put King Vegeta on the ground, angered by his own failure and weakness. He awaits the finishing blow, but it never comes. Bardock extends a hand to King Vegeta. He doesn't want to be king of the Saiyans. He just wants his son to come home and a new path to be forged for the Saiyans. King Vegeta takes the hand and rises from the ground. He smiles, and Bardock thinks he's finally understood what needs to happen. Fool. King Vegeta spits on Bardock's mercy and destroys the repaired Frieza ship in a single blast. Bardock snaps, and with a single punch, ends the king's life. He looks around at the other Saiyans, who all immediately kneel before the Super Saiyan. Bardock looks for Gine, and eventually spots her on the ground, sobbing. Without that ship, they won't be able to go get their son, and they'd need to wait at least five more years for a new ship to be finished. Luckily, they won't have to wait a decade, as new ships were already started, but five years longer was something Gine's emotions just couldn't handle at that moment. Bardock reverts to his base form and helps Gine off the ground, and the two begin to head to their home, but are stopped before they can leave. A royal advisor to King Vegeta tells Bardock that the Saiyans need a king, and as the person who defeated King Vegeta, Bardock should take that role. This isn't what Bardock wanted. Political power meant very little to him. He just wanted to save the Saiyans, and more importantly, save his family. He almost declines the offer, but he realizes both of his goals would be helped by him becoming the king of the Saiyans. He could chart a new peaceful path for the warrior race, and he could even focus on getting his son before anything else. Reluctantly, Bardock accepts his new role as king and is escorted to the castle where he is inaugurated and will live for the rest of his days. Over the next five years, the lower class Saiyans came to revere Bardock as more than just a king, but also a messiah. His mission of a peaceful life for the Saiyans was in full effect. The Saiyans under him seemed to enjoy this lifestyle, but that was about to change when the first Saiyan ship was completed and Bardock says he's leaving to rescue his son. The Saiyans didn't understand. A journey like this would take some time both ways, and without their leader, their savior. Could they really be safe? Regardless, he is their king, and with the Super Saiyan form, no one could stop him from doing what he wants anyway. So Bardock and Gine board the newly made ship to retrieve their son. He tells his advisors to take care of things while he is gone, and reassures all the Saiyans that he'll be back as quickly as possible. The Saiyans salute their leader on his way off. So the pair set off on their mission to rescue their son. The round trip would take around a year by itself, not including time spent searching for Kakarot once they arrive on Earth. Meanwhile, news has reached Vegeta, Nappa, and Raditz about the rebellion against and the death of King Vegeta. But this news isn't given to them by the Saiyans. It's a vengeful father and retired emperor, King Cold, who delivers the news, twisting the truth as he tells the tale. Cold tells the Saiyans that Bardock had immediately gone to kill King Vegeta after becoming the Super Saiyan, and Frieza heroically gave his life trying to stop him. This, of course, never happened, but they had no way to know that. Raditz goes to speak up and defend his father, but Vegeta, in a blind rage, blasts him, killing him on the spot. King Cold smiles while not facing the two, and tells them that due to the nature of this tragedy, he will allow the Saiyans to do whatever they feel fit to mourn. The two bow and leave his room. Vegeta tells Nappa that the Saiyans will recognize him as the prince and he will retake his planet, 
claiming his rightful place as the king of Planet Vegeta. So they take one of King Cold's ships and head to Planet Vegeta immediately. The journey doesn't take long at all. Only a couple of days after Bardock had left the planet with Guinea, Nappa and Vegeta arrive, back after being gone for a decade on missions of conquest and working directly for King Cold. The Saiyans surround the ship as it lands, suspecting a group of Frieza soldiers to come out seeking revenge. But all their weapons and charged key blasts are lowered when they see two Saiyans exit the ship. Nappa and Vegeta are welcomed back to the planet with open arms. So, where is this new king of yours? The Saiyans tell the now fully grown prince that Bardock is off world and he'd be gone for at least a year. This opportunity is immediately apparent to the young prince. In his absence, it would be my honor to help guide the Saiyans forward on his mission. The Saiyans were clearly upset and lost with the quick departure of Bardock, so they cheered this idea on and accepted Vegeta as a temporary ruler of Planet Vegeta. Nappa is surprised to hear Vegeta continue the peaceful life of the Saiyans, but Vegeta tells Nappa that they will be no match for a being that could beat Frieza. They will play Bardock's game while they train in secret to defeat the so-called Super Saiyan. Nappa is still nervous since the Super Saiyan is supposedly unbeatable, but Vegeta reassures him that he will become a Super Saiyan as well. If a low-class warrior like him can achieve that power, then a prince will have no difficulty doing the same. With that, Vegeta and Nappa begin to use the facilities of Planet Vegeta to train even having special training rooms built to exploit Saiyan biology. Meanwhile, King Cold is on his ship pondering his next move. If the Super Saiyan could easily defeat Frieza, then it could potentially defeat him as well. Using Vegeta and Nappa to scout the situation would benefit him greatly, especially if he could get them to be Super Saiyans as well. He could easily defeat this usurper with their unwitting help. With this set, Around half a year passes. Bardock and Guinea arrive on Earth, using their scouters to locate Kakarot and fly to him, arriving at Mount Paozu right outside the home of Grandpa Gohan. Grandpa Gohan emerges from the hut to confront them. What will happen next? Bardock and Guinea are on Earth to get Kakarot when they are met by Grandpa Gohan. As they arrive, the sky begins to go dark and the full moon begins to rise. Of course, without looking at the moon, they won't transform, and Grandpa Gohan quickly tells Goku to stay inside the hut. If you haven't realized yet, this is the night Grandpa Gohan would have died. But with Bardock and Guinea on Earth, the circumstances have changed. The 10 years that have passed on planet Vegeta equate to 8 years on Earth, around a year before the adventure of Dragon Ball would normally begin. Now, we don't know when Gohan died in canon, or what the difference in year lengths between Planet Vegeta and Earth actually are, but as you can tell from the first part, this is just a story for fun more so than these nuanced details, so don't focus on them too much. Grandpa Gohan notices Bardock and Guinea's tails and invites them inside, assuming who they are based on that fact alongside Bardock's hairstyle. Bardock doesn't want to go in, thinking they should just take their child and leave. He considers using force, but Gine tells him to calm down for now. They shouldn't risk Goku being caught in the crossfire for some big battle, even if the fight would be one-sided. Once they enter, Grandpa Gohan offers them a drink, and Goku hides behind his adoptive grandfather, unsure about the people in front of him. Bardock doesn't take anything to drink, while Gine happily accepts. Grandpa Gohan says he assumes they're both the boy's parents, and Gine nods. Bardock is looking away, not wanting to waste time on this at all. Grandpa Gohan notices Bardock's disinterest, but presses on. He tells the pair how he found Goku's pod in the woods and took him in, how the boy was rowdy when they first met, until one day he tussled his way out of Grandpa Gohan's arms and fell off a cliff, landing on his head. This gets Bardock's attention immediately, and he snaps at Gohan for being so careless with their child. Gine pulls Bardock back, and Gohan profusely apologizes. He tells them that from that day on, Goku behaved perfectly fine. I'd always just assumed the lad was a bit rough by nature, and that the head bump sorted him out. Bardock is starting to get angry again, thinking that Gohan is trying to imply something about his child and himself. But... 
after meeting you. Parents who care enough about their boy to travel across the stars to find him. I don't think he was rowdy or rough at all. I think the lad missed you both and just wanted to go back home. Gine begins to cry and Bardock is at a loss for words. He can't believe that his son, a Saiyan, would have such attachments to parents he barely knew. Gohan then tells them that he thinks the head bump may have given the boy amnesia, hence the change in attitude. Gine begins to become even more upset, and Bardock holds back his own emotions as he tries to console her. Gohan apologizes once again, but smiles to himself. A long time ago, I decided to live my days in isolation, a hermit like the master who came before me. I'd already achieved all I wanted, and I felt as though others had nothing left to offer me. The two Saiyans turn their attention to Gohan as he continues. Then, I met your lad. Gohan looks down at Goku, who looks back at his adoptive grandfather as well. There's a lot I've still got to live for. A lot of adventures and people who can change my life. And maybe I can even change theirs. Gohan gets up from his seat and bows to Bardock and Gine. Thank you for sending your son to Earth. He changed my life for the better. After this exchange, Gohan offers to let the two stay the night and even have dinner with him before they take Goku and return to planet Vegeta. They agree, with even Bardock being moved by Gohan's story and grateful that someone so kind had saved his son. So, after a night of eating and talking, they all go to sleep. When Bardock and Gine wake up, though, they see that Goku and Gohan aren't in the hut. A little bit of concern overtakes them, but they hear the two outside. When they step out, they see Goku and Gohan doing their morning training as they always do. Martial arts is a way of life for the two. So, on their final day together, Goku and Gohan spar for one final time. Bardock and Gine just decide to watch the two. While Gohan was still weak by Saiyan standards, he's still stronger than Goku and most of the beings on Earth. There was something peaceful about the way the two fight and train, a thing the Saiyans don't really even believe in. As Bardock and Gine watch the two fight, a communication is being requested on Bardock's scouter. He answers it and says he's busy and will be returning to planet Vegeta shortly. Unfortunately, it's his advisor calling, and it's not a pleasant call. He tells Bardock about Prince Vegeta returning and taking over leadership in his absence. The advisor goes on to tell Bardock that Vegeta has been upholding Bardock's will for the Saiyans as well. This pleases Bardock since he doesn't want to be king anyway, so he asks what's the issue. Bardock's advisor tells him that Vegeta has requested training facilities be built in secret for the prince and Nappa alone to use. They did it without informing the royal advisor to avoid the news getting back to Bardock. Based on their recent power readings though, it is possible that the two Saiyan elites may overtake Bardock in terms of power before he can return to planet Vegeta. They may even seek to become Super Saiyans as well. Bardock begins to think what their next move should be, but before he can give any commands, the communication is cut off. His advisor has been killed for treachery. Bardock turns the communicator on his scouter off and tells Gine what's going on back on planet Vegeta. He doesn't have the heart to tell her that he suspects the worst for Raditz though. She asks him what they're going to do, but he just hands her his scouter. She's confused by what Bardock is doing. He explains to her that for the moment, planet Vegeta isn't safe to return to at least not with his son and wife by his side. So he's making the decision to return to planet Vegeta and face the prince. There's a good chance if he leaves immediately, he'll still be stronger than the pair of Saiyans waiting for him. Grandpa Gohan interjects and tells Bardock that if he's sure about doing this on his own, he should do one thing before he leaves Earth. So, after completing the task Grandpa Gohan laid out for him, Bardock leaves Gine and Goku with Grandpa Gohan. In Bardock's year-long journey back to planet Vegeta, Prince Vegeta reaches his full height and peak body, so he's able to gain the most from his training. On Earth, Gine, Goku, and Grandpa Gohan join Bulma on her trip to hunt the Dragon Balls, and with the help of Grandpa Gohan and Gine, who was once a Saiyan warrior as well, they have no trouble thwarting Pilaf's plans for world conquest. 
Finally, Bardock arrives back on planet Vegeta, an unexpected landing that startles everyone present at the landing bay. When Bardock exits the ship, he doesn't say a word and makes his way to the castle where he barges into the throne room. To the utter surprise of Vegeta and Nappa, the Super Saiyan is now standing before them. Vegeta snaps at his advisor since he was told Bardock's scouter was still on Earth. The reason he gave it to Gine was to have the element of surprise. The advisor replies the scouter is on Earth and that Bardock must have left it there on purpose. Bardock's eyes lock onto the advisor. The advisor who'd once been his. The advisor who warned him to stay away from planet Vegeta. Now he gets it. His advisor crawled right back to the royal bloodline the minute it returned and lied to try and keep Bardock away for longer so they could guarantee their victory. Too bad for them, he came back immediately and is ready for a fight. Bardock transforms into his Super Saiyan form for the first time in years and radiates his power level of 500,000. Vegeta looks at his scouter and laughs. It turns out they didn't need to train longer after all. They were training to beat Frieza's power level of 530,000, not a mere 500,000. While Nappa still has no chance of beating Bardock, Vegeta is boasting a power level of 520,000. Not enough to beat Frieza yet, but more than enough to beat Bardock even as a Super Saiyan. So the two begin to battle, and while Bardock isn't being completely destroyed, he is on the losing side. Every attack dealing more and more damage until Bardock's moves become sluggish and his body becomes heavy, eventually reverting to his base form. Vegeta laughs at Bardock's weakness and begins to gloat that he is the true Super Saiyan. That's not important to Bardock though. While Vegeta rambles and gloats, Bardock begins to think about his family, just like he did before turning Super Saiyan the first time. But this time, there's no miracle power to save him, and he's too late to save one of his children already, as it is. At least, he'll die comfortably, knowing that his child and wife are safe on Earth. Wait, Earth? He remembers what Grandpa Gohan told him to do before leaving that planet. He told him to visit someone and to ask for something, a request for an item a last resort. Bardock reaches into his wristband and pulls out a single bean. Gohan had told him to eat this if he was ever in trouble, so he decided to risk it and eats the bean. Of course, this is a Senzu bean, and Bardock is instantly healed to full strength. While Vegeta was gloating about the public execution he'd set up for Bardock so the people are reminded who their true king is, he even begins to say how he wishes Raditz could have witnessed Bardock's death, Bardock gets up and turns into a Super Saiyan once again. Vegeta laughs and tells Bardock that it's useless to fight him. What Vegeta doesn't realize is not only has Bardock been healed, he has received a Zenkai boost. Now, Zenkai boosts are fairly arbitrary narrative devices rather than straight numerical values, so I'm just going to grant Bardock a 10 times boost, which isn't too far-fetched considering what we saw on Namek in canon. This pushes Bardock to a power level of 5 million in his Super Saiyan form, far beyond anything Vegeta could hope to achieve, and because of that, the Saiyan Prince never becomes the true king, and Bardock retains his unwanted crown. Under his breath, Bardock says, that was for Raditz. So with Bardock victorious, he has to remove and imprison any and all traitors within his ranks. If he doesn't, threats to his family can emerge again. As he deals with the traitors, he finds out some disturbing information. King Cold wants Bardock's head for killing Frieza. This is a much greater risk to his family than he realized. Bardock links with Gine Scouter and tells her to stay on Earth for just a little bit longer. Until he can ensure their safety, Kakarot and Gine can't return to planet Vegeta. Gine understands and asks how long he thinks it will take, but he doesn't have an answer for her. For now, she would have to raise Kakarot on Earth with the help of Gohan. So the two parents are split apart once again. On Earth, they eventually go to Kame House to have Goku trained from the ground up in the Turtle School style of martial arts. 
If they don't have to leave before it arrives, he'll even compete in the Tenkaichi Budokai. On planet Vegeta, Bardock trains in the facilities Vegeta made and uses the methods that exploit the adaptive nature of Saiyan biology, such as comrades inflicting fatal injuries and gravity training. Things will come to a head when Bardock is confronted by King Cold in our next part. But the retired emperor may not be alone. Now, one final threat seems to loom over the Super Saiyan's head before he and his family can truly be safe. Deep in space, on a ship that's similar to Frieza's, rests the retired emperor of the universe, <laughs> King Cold. Now, as many of you have pointed out, King Cold is strong. Very, very strong. While still weaker than Frieza's final form, we have no reason to believe he's weaker than Frieza's first form, especially considering how much his power frightens everyone on Earth in the original version of events, also making them think there are two Frieza's. But more importantly than his power is his own superstitious nature. King Cold tries to manipulate and explain what he considers unexplainable through superstitious belief, like the idea that Trunks was only powerful because of his sword since he couldn't be a Super Saiyan in Cold's eyes. This superstitious nature would extend to the legend of the Super Saiyan as well, believing it to truly be unbeatable, especially after hearing it killed Frieza and the Saiyan Prince who trained specifically to stop it. With this on his mind, Cold wants nothing more than revenge and his empire back under his heel. However, the Super Saiyan isn't his only issue. The power of the Super Saiyan caused a shift in Saiyan mentality, and without a suitable replacement for the Saiyan King, the warrior race is likely to rebel, costing Cold over half of his army. He'd have to find someone willing to work for him and take over the Saiyan race, a person willing to fight Bardock, strong enough to beat him and able to be ruled over. Luckily for Cold, an answer to his prayers would be brought to his doorstep. King Cold had sent all his men out hunting for one very solution, and a single lead pointed them to their only option. A Saiyan strong enough to take over the Saiyan race, but naive enough to be manipulated. Broly with Paragus lusting for revenge and Broly being reserved and generally lacking autonomy, they make for the perfect pair to be manipulated and controlled. So preparations are made to head to Planet Vampa, then Planet Vegeta. A careful lie about who Bardock is, a secret relative of King Vegeta III, will do perfectly to have Paragus and by extension Broly on his side. The journey to Vampa and then back to planet Vegeta would take around a year, giving Bardock a chance to train in the facilities made by Vegeta. So over the course of the year, Bardock exploits the Zenkai boosts of his race and their genetic disposition to adapt to different gravity until they reach their limits. From there, he realizes that focusing on the Super Saiyan transformation will be the next step to evolving his abilities even further. However, achieving something like Super Saiyan 2 or 3 will be outside his reach, relegating him to Super Saiyan Grade 4 by the time his training is finished. Now, I'm not saying he's Cell Saga tier after being at a power level of 5 million only a year prior, simply that he has the right mentality for long-term training, something else he picked up from Grandpa Gohan in his communications with Earth over the last year. Speaking of Earth, Goku did stay long enough to compete in the Tenkaichi Budokai, and with the help of Gine, everyone from the Turtle School is far stronger from training with her. However, the final battle isn't between Goku and Jackie Chun, it's between Goku and his mother, Gine. Notably, Gine instills the same lesson in Goku that Roshi sought to teach all of his students. There's always someone stronger. So she beats Goku and becomes the world martial arts champion. After losing to his mother, Goku says he'll have to train a lot more to be able to keep up with her, but she tells him she's not the end goal. Even among the Saiyans, she's nowhere near the strongest, and beyond their people, stronger people may exist within the vastness of the universe. This excites Goku for the future of his potential and the foes who wait for him in the vastness of space. As Goku looks up to the stars, deep in space, the clash of the strongest Saiyans is about to happen. 
Broly and Bardock are on a collision course with each other. After his daily training, Bardock finds himself spending time with the prisoners from the failed insurrection. He has no desire to kill them and hopes for a future where the Saiyans are something more. A future where their children are children and not soldiers. A future they won't reach if they continue to kill their own. Today's visit had to be cut short as a communication on Bardock's scouter warns of an approaching ship, the ship of King Cold. Bardock knew this day would come, and all he can hope is that his training has been enough. When King Cold exits his ship, he's surrounded by Saiyan warriors, with Bardock in the center ready to face him. But Cold isn't alone, followed by the manipulated Paragus and Broly, who are the real adversaries for Bardock to face down. Now, Bardock is far more conflicted. His message has been one against killing his fellow Saiyans. But if they stand with King Cold, should they be given such mercy? All of the insurrectionists were inherently fighting for King Cold and he let them live. So it would be unfair to treat these two any differently. Before Bardock can even say a word to them, Paragus orders Broly to attack and Bardock quickly turns Super Saiyan in response. Now, before you start raging about the power difference, this Broly is much younger than the one in Dragon Ball Super Broly. That means he hasn't been training for over 40 years on Vampa that he did originally. I'm not saying he's weak, but he's just not as strong. Bardock is clearly on the back foot. In the midst of combat, he's trying to talk to Broly, but his words are falling on deaf ears. Broly is merely an instrument of his father, so any enemy of his father is an enemy of his. Paragus laughs and taunts Bardock, telling him that his royal blood will pay for what his brother has done. Bardock's eyes widen. He uses all his power to knock Broly away and tells Paragus that he doesn't have a brother. Broly is ready to strike again, but Paragus tells him to hold back. He tells Bardock to stop lying for no reason. He already knows that he's the brother of King Vegeta III. Before he lets Broly kill the new king, he wants to hear Bardock admit it himself. Bardock repeats he has no brother, especially not the king who tried to stop him from seeing his son again. And that resonates with Paragus. King Vegeta tried to keep Paragus away from Broly as well. If Bardock was also a victim of King Vegeta's selfishness and ego, then that means their true enemy is... Before the thought can finish, Paragus is killed by King Cold, who has no time for more Saiyan adversaries. This was a mistake though, as Broly's body begins to enlarge in a rage, first transforming into his Ikari form, and then into Super Saiyan as well. In a blind rage, Broly begins to dismantle King Cold with ease. Vengeance for his father wouldn't be enough to soothe his rage and sorrow though, so even after King Cold is killed, Broly's rampage doesn't stop. Bardock jumps in front of Broly before he can attack the other Saiyans and tells him to calm down, but he can't and begins to attack Bardock as well. Bardock starts to have trouble breathing, but manages to say with the very last of his breath that there's a way for Paragus to be revived. If Broly kills him now, that'll never happen. This is finally enough to calm Broly down, who collapses from the sudden power expenditure. Bardock has his medics preserve Paragus's body and put Broly into a healing tank for the minimal injuries he's sustained. Bardock sends a transmission to Guinea on Earth with his scouter and tells her to collect the Dragon Balls that she told him about. They are one wish away from being able to be together again. The gathering of the Dragon Balls requires the defeat of the Red Ribbon Army, but this is a simple task for Goku and Gine, who are able to revive Paragus with one simple wish and are far more thorough than Goku was when he destroyed the army originally. No Dr. Jiro escape happens this time, thanks to this mother and son duo. On Planet Vegeta, the Saiyan medics confirm Paragus' revival just as Bardock had predicted. Once he's up, he takes Broly to him and both of them are extremely grateful, though Broly isn't very good at saying it. Bardock says this is the future he envisions for the Saiyans, forgiveness and understanding, where parents can see their children grow up instead of having them sent off world. Paragus's eyes begin to gloss over, but the older Saiyan doesn't allow himself to cry. This is the future the Saiyans should strive towards, a future that would allow his son to be his son 
instead of just a weapon for revenge. Since Bardock can see that his words have reached Paragus, there is one final thing he wants Paragus to see, but he'd prefer if they go alone. Broly wants to follow, but Paragus tells him it's fine, and the two leave. Bardock takes Paragus to the prison where the Saiyan insurrectionists have been restrained. In the furthest and most isolated cell is Vegeta, the son of the man who exiled Broly and Paragus by extension. They don't enter the cell and merely observe him through one-way glass. Bardock asks what Paragus thinks about this. Can his hatred for the former king be ignored when looking at his son? Can Paragus truly understand what Bardock's plans for forgiveness actually entails? Paragus is clenching his fist and struggles to keep himself composed, but ultimately, he thinks of another life he may have had with Broly if Bardock were king and not Vegeta. If Bardock's ways were adopted before Broly was outcast, with an exhausted exhale, Paragus says he can forgive him should he wish to accept it. This is all Bardock needed to hear. He asks Paragus if he'd be willing to take over as king of the Saiyans. Paragus is shocked by the offer, but Bardock says it's not such a simple switch. While he has faith in Paragus after this, he can't risk him reverting to the old ways of the Saiyans, and so if Paragus agrees to become king, then Broly will come to Earth with Bardock. Paragus is slightly irritated by the proposition since his entire crusade against the royal family started because his son was taken away from him. Bardock assures him that this isn't even remotely exile. The planet that Bardock is going to is weak, but full of spirit. The emotions the Saiyans lacked for so long are in abundance there. There's even new things to learn from the less technologically advanced world. Then Bardock smiles and says that his son really likes Earth, so he's sure Broly will too. That was all Paragus needed to hear. He lifts his head up high and accepts Bardock's offer, though he tells the Super Saiyan that regardless of what title he's granted, the Saiyans will always look to Bardock as their true king. Bardock chuckles and says that's probably for the best. The legend of the Super Saiyan will hopefully keep this world peaceful. So Bardock returns to Earth where he raises Goku and helps to protect that world. Since Goku was on Earth for the hunt for the Dragon Balls, he even still marries Chi Chi. Piccolo Jr. ends up getting sealed in this version, and after that, with no Saiyans to invade or Frieza to learn of the Dragon Balls, and no Jiro who escaped and seeks revenge, this means it's a peaceful life. Even if Bobbity does arrive to revive Majin Buu, the Saiyan family alongside Broly are more than enough to handle that resurrection before it can even begin. Until one day, a certain God of Destruction awakens and makes his way to Earth, where there are multiple Super Saiyans currently. When Bardock sees Beerus, he recognizes him from what his advisors told him on planet Vegeta, the being that even Frieza feared. He bows to the god who asks Bardock how he knows who the god of destruction is. Only the king and Frieza's clan know of him. Bardock tells him that he was once the king of planet Vegeta and apologizes for any transgressions caused by the last generation of Saiyans. They've reformed and changed their ways. Beerus asks Whis if that's true, and Whis looks at his staff. In it, Whis sees an older Saiyan sitting on the throne who's not related to the Vegeta royal bloodline. He sees they've not conquered any worlds, and in fact have used their power to make allies in the universe, helping where they can in return getting supplies. If Whis looks far enough back in time, he can see it was in fact Bardock that began this new lifestyle for the Saiyans. Beerus never thought he'd see the day. Having planet Vegeta destroyed was something he agreed with after all, even if Frieza had his own motives for it as well. This makes Beerus ask Bardock if his 39 year long nap was to wait for him. Is he the Super Saiyan God? Eventually, they all reach the conclusion of using the Dragon Balls that are conveniently on the ship that is hosting Bulma's birthday party. They learn of the ritual, and everyone seems to agree that Bardock should become the Super Saiyan God. But he declines. If Beerus was supposed to wait 39 years for this great rival, then it wasn't ever about Bardock. It was about Bardock's son. So Goku becomes the Super Saiyan God and gives Beerus the fight he was craving. Bardock looks to the sky with Gine and is proud of the world they were able to make together. His grandchildren and Broly join him in watching Goku. His only regret 
is that Raditz didn't live to make it here. Even the Dragon Balls would be too late to revive him. A tear rolls down Bardock's face before he looks at Goten and Gohan and smiles. They will never experience what the Saiyans were, what they did. His future worked, and there's no point in worrying about the past. They move forward together, united against anything that would stand against them. The next few arcs are made ridiculously easy due to Broly being around and no future timeline, so don't worry about any of that. This thematic ending is the best place to end our story as it focuses on Bardock, not Goku and the others. And I hope you enjoyed the ride. Make sure you like and subscribe if you haven't yet, and thank you so very much for watching.